So it's about time to start. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the fourth panel of today, where we deal with policy supporting younger people. My name is Christian Oetschlegel. I work for the Akuni Deutschland, one of the organizers of this conference. And uh, I am very glad that we have now another hour of discussion with fine experts that have joined us uh, for our conference. Policy supporting younger people uh, are important because we know that uh, we have a, a huge group of disadvantaged young people who need special support in order to participate in our society. And um, I am very happy that we have two experts now on the panel. We're still waiting for our keynote speaker. And so I would suggest that we change, uh, uh, that we do not start with the keynote, of course, but that we start with your comments and uh, your ideas uh, on the topic. And uh, first of all, I would like to introduce um, our first speaker, uh, O'Neill Masamba. Uh, she works for uh, the World Bank and is manager of the World Bank Group Youth Summit 2022, which will take place just a few days uh, at the end of May. And so I'm very glad that you made it, I'm, though you might be very busy organizing uh, <laughs> this conference. So thanks for joining us. Uh, you're a citizen of uh, France and the Republic of Congo and uh, joined the World Bank in February 2020. And um, before you did this, uh, you worked as uh, an attorney. You're uh, admitted to practice in the state of New York but you've been to uh, Canada before and um, worked uh, as an infrastructure lawyer in Canada for three years where you negotiated major infrastructure projects. Um, so I'm very excited to have you here. And I would like to start uh, actually when we uh, talk about policies supporting younger people, what uh, is it comes into your mind? What is your uh, issue that you would like to contribute uh, to this topic. Thank you very much uh, and thank you for having me join this panel. I, I'm really excited to be here um, to talk about uh, how policies can be supporting young people, especially since it's definitely a subject that we will be also touching upon as part of the Youth Summit. Uh, and so, yeah, my initial thoughts uh, when thinking of policies supporting young people, so there's two things. Um, I would like to touch upon. So there's obviously my thoughts on what it is, but also I would like to touch upon the importance of funding education and education accessibility. Um, so first talking about uh, the importance of policy supporting young people and what it means to me. Uh, so for me, policies that support young people are policies that foster inclusion at every level. So I'm thinking of social, economic and environmental inclusion, but I'm also thinking of policies that would allow young people to be change makers and actively participate in our goal of ending poverty and achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030. And I think it's important here to give some context to our audience about what I mean by social, environmental and economic inclusion. And so for social inclusion, I'm going to use the definition of the World Bank Group, which defines it as, and I'm quoting here, the process of improving the terms on which individuals and groups take part in society, improving the ability, opportunity and dignity of those disadvantaged on the basis of their identity. Now, talking about environmental inclusion, I think it can be defined as the effort undertaken to build green and resilient recovery, fostering an inclusive and green growth, and making sure that no communities are left behind when we develop solutions to tackle environmental issues. And finally, economic inclusion can be understood as the the fact of providing inclusive and equitable access to economic opportunity. And so if you take those three elements of inclusion in the context of youth, in my opinion, developing policies that support younger people consist in implementing measures and policy that would allow young people to be decision makers um, and be involved in decision making process of governments and international organizations that have an impact on their communities or even globally. It's also about enabling young people 
people to have access to opportunities within our economy, which means fostering access to education, training, and youth entrepreneurship. And so now focusing on, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please go ahead. I was just wondering, when we talk about these uh, issues that you just mentioned, uh, there are already existing programs and fundings. Uh, so, so do you think they are sufficient? And uh, or, or what, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. And, and yes, indeed, there's uh, already a lot of uh, programs available uh, to fund education. And again, education is really important because educational opportunities and access to the labor market are instrumental if you want to avoid that younger people that already accumulated disadvantages early in life and then being exposed to higher risk of poverty and adulthood, uh, in adulthood and at old age. And I would like to highlight uh, some of the programs that are being done, but then talk about some of the weaknesses of, their pro of those programs. So the World Bank Group, for instance, is really involved in financing projects in education. Actually, the World Bank Group is the largest financer of education in the developing world. And uh, the World Bank Group has been working on education projects in 90 countries now. So there's a multitude of projects I could uh, cite, but I would maybe focus on one, which is a project in Senegal called the Senegal Investing in Early Years for Human Development Project. That is a multi-sectoral project that will reach 2.5 million children and their parents through integrated community-based nutrition, early stimulation and parenting education program, and make sure that more than 200,000 children are enrolled in formal preschool or Quranic preschools. So you can see here that there's different efforts being made to make sure uh, that youth education is, is supported. However, despite those different initiatives being implemented, disparities still exist. Indeed, according to the World Bank and the UNESCO Education Finance Watch, two-thirds of low and lower middle income countries have cut their public education budget since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And in comparison, only one-third of upper middle and high income countries have reduced their budgets. So that really shows that uh, we need to make more efforts in financing education. But what we also have to keep in mind is that the challenge with financing education is not just about mobilizing resources, but it's also about improving the effectiveness of the fundings already allocated to education. So thank you very much uh, for your first statement and your yeah, strong statement to uh, encourage governments to, to, high, to, to improve education in the country because they are important uh, for the future of the citizens and also, of course, of the country. Now I'd like to, to introduce our next speaker, which is uh, Mathieu Brossard. He is Chief of Research on Education and Development at the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, the UNICEF. And um, he's been appointed as Chief of Education uh, on the Office of Research Innocenti in 2019. And he joined UNICEF in 2012 as Senior Education Advisor and, um, yeah, we're glad to have you here as another education expert, and I would like to hear your uh, comments and views uh, from, from a maybe slightly different perspective, though I've seen that you've already also worked for the World Bank, so uh, you're also familiar to that context. Matt. Thank you, Christian. Can you hear me well? Yes, perfect. And thanks for the introduction. Indeed, I'm a... I'm a former senior economist at the World Bank, and uh, before that, I worked for UNESCO and before that for the French government. So you can call me a, a polyamorous kind of guy. I mean, I, I still love the World Bank. I still love the French government. I still love UNESCO. But now I work at UNICEF, indeed, uh, leading uh, an amazing team of 30, uh, a bit more actually now, uh, more than 30 education researchers, both qualitative and quantitative researchers. Um, and for those who don't know, um, I'm based in Italy, in Florence, where the Office of Research of UNICEF is. Uh, the UNICEF Office of Research called also in, in Ocean Tea was uh, set up 30 years ago. We have uh, three mandates. One is to do research, quality research. Second is to enhance the use of research and third is to have a convening function and a thought leadership kind of function. Uh, within uh, the education team that I have the honor to, to, to coordinate, to manage, um, we work in 50 plus countries on different topics. 
but we really uh, uh, a big mandate to uh, to co-create research with governments, with uh, beneficiaries, including youth people, uh, because we know more and more that it's the best way to have the research being used and leading to policy change and to implementation. Uh, so after this kind of introduction, which was a bit uh, bragging about our office, let me come to the topic. And uh, thanks, O'Neill, for the, for the really great uh, speech. Uh, and I will agree on, on all of it more, um, in a nutshell. But maybe I can give some compliment to it in relation to uh, what are we talking really when we are talking about education? Because education is known as by everybody, everybody, most of the people have children, most of the people have children going to school. But from a UNICEF perspective and with an equity perspective, which is not contradictory with the World Bank perspective, we have also the, you know, ending poverty as one of its uh, big goal. Of course, we are paying attention to the most disadvantaged children. Those that, and I really like when the youth are engaged in all those things with, in reference to the sustainable development goals, etc. But the, the children and the adolescents that we talk about, they are not even literate. They don't have even parents that are literate. So they are never consulted in those fora. So that's those I want to talk about. And I will start by using actually a, a statistic that comes from the World Bank, which has been a game changer. It was World Bank and UNESCO, and we supported it as UNICEF. It was just before the COVID started. It's what we call the learning poverty. And for those who don't know, the learning poverty means not being able to read, a sim read and understand a simple text by the age of 10. And I'm sure within our audience, most of the people, they have children, they have nieces, they have new views. I mean, we all think that kids should learn and read by five, six, seven. But just a striking number, which is always, always shocking me, always actually also giving me more motivation every day to go to work and to try to do stuff is that even pre-COVID, more than half of the children from low-income and middle-income countries, so two-thirds of the world, uh, were not able to read a simple text by the age of 10, even when they go to school. And of course, COVID didn't help, quite the opposite. Uh, COVID uh, exacerbated this, um, this uh, learning crisis, as we call it. Uh, with uh, big people at the World Bank, big people at UNICEF or others. We are now estimating that seven out of 10 uh, children are in this uh, learning poverty trap, meaning not able to read a simple text by the age of 10. And uh, when we are talking with an inequity perspective in terms of countries, if you talk about Sub-Saharan Africa, even before COVID, nine out of 10 children were not able to read by the age of 10. So what do we do? Because that's like 25 years I work in the sector, 25 years I try to help, 25 years I'm like really motivated to make a difference for those kids that were born in a place that is not the place I was born in. I was born in Paris in a teacher's family, it's a middle income class in, in France. And I think I was lucky. But what we do we do for those that have no voice, those that are not even in those fora, those that are forgotten? in order to build their capacity, give them a chance and help them building their societies in an inclusive way. Do we say just education, education, education? That's what we have done for the last 20 years. So let's be a bit more precise. Let's not do the usual shopping list of, I want to do pre-primary education, primary education, secondary education, higher education, uh, accelerated learning, non-formal education, formal education, skills for blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When we do that, as we have been doing as an international community for 20 years, we don't do anything because when everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. So let's be serious, let's do something. And there is upcoming in September, the Transforming Education Summit with head of states that the World Bank, UNESCO, UNICEF, others are very involved in. Let's try to make a difference. Let's change the business as usual. Let's be transformative, really. And it means what? It means that, yes, everything is important, but maybe there are things that are even more important than others. And I want to talk about pre-primary education, the early years, because brain development, you know, what you learn at your early years is more important than what you learn after. It's more impactful. But you know what? In Africa, 
only 10 to 15 percent of kids go to preschool. It is the usual thing for our families, for our nephews, for our nieces in Europe or in US or wherever, not in Africa. And that could make a difference. Talking about then foundational learning, I was mentioning the learning poverty numbers before. There is more and more kids going to primary education, but even when they go, the quality of the learning is not good enough and they don't learn, as I was saying. So let's also put emphasis on that. And of course, secondary education, higher education are important. They have good rates of return. I'm sure Akani will talk about it in terms of earnings, in terms of the private earnings of people. But if we look at the cost benefit for a society perspective, there is more to be done at the early years, pre-primary, primary, what we call foundational learning. I love, and I will stop here. I know I'm already going over time. Sorry, Christian. But I will stop with that thing. Something that I've been said rightly, and someone that died now, who was the, the director of Global Education at Gates Foundation, Girin. He died last year, six months ago. And before, the, so you cannot imagine he had some politics, some, some ambition or what. He did just something great before, before passing away. He put on the table to the World Bank, to UNESCO, to UNICEF, to all the people that cares forever about the importance of education on the table, the need that we need to do. What would we need to do? We need to prioritize the foundational learning. We need to prioritize the most vulnerable children. We need to prioritize the low and middle income countries. And I will just stop here because I think it's big enough and it's the thing we should do. The rest is important, but at some point we need to prioritize. Over. Thank you very much, Matt, for this strong statement for preschool education and uh, and to focus uh, on, on certain forms of education. And I would uh, like to continue, but I just got the um, message that Akani is now with us. Uh, I can't see him. Um, so if you're here, just please turn your video on and uh, make a heard. Yes. Hi, Andres. Welcome. I'm sorry, I thought it was 5 p.m. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, so, yeah. Yeah, so now I'm we're here. glad to have you with us now. And, Thank you so much. Um, hope you're prepared uh, for your keynote. Yes, please. So I, we have already started the discussion and okay. we have uh, started with the comments on um, policies so so O'Neill and Matt have already made short statements but I think it's perfect time for you to jump into the discussion to give us your presentation and then we'll continue our discussion afterwards so um, please let me introduce you to uh, our uh, guests uh, you're professor of demography and social statistics at Obafemi Avolovo University in Nigeria and uh, you've conducted research on migration in Africa aging and population, and reproductive health dynamics. You've led many national and also regional migration research programs in Nigeria, in Ghana, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and the Gambia. And you've enjoyed many academic fellowships. So you were a fellow at, the, uh, at Harvard University, at John Hopkins University, and at the African Center for Migration Studies at the University of Witwatersrand, or also at the uh, Rostock Demographic Center. So um, we are glad to have such a uh, demographic expert now with us. And uh, we are now very interested in your presentation and the floor is all yours. Thank you, Andrea. Please, can I share my slide? Of course, yes, okay. please. Oh, please. Okay, thank you. Please, please, can you see my slide? Uh, no, not yet. Yes, now we can see your slides. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, firstly, let me apologize. I don't know. I miss it. Uh, the time for me was 5 p.m. Uh, but I guess maybe then we are one hour behind, behind time. Uh, I'm also sharing another conference at the university. So I just went briefly to see them. I uh, hoping that we come before. So I'm, I'm very sorry. So because of time, let me just go straight to the, uh, to the talk on policy supporting younger people. Um, I would like to present this, this framework. I, I read a lot around this, and uh, for me, this framework looks like, um, so that, that for me, this framework therefore provided uh, what we call a kind of holistic 
uh, framework, uh, you know, towards appreciating issues around what policy uh, framework uh, should we be looking at at a global level, a regional level, at national level, and even at national level in terms of uh, uh, moving the agenda, you know, for uh, empowering youth forward. So this is called the Youth Development Index. It was, uh, I got in this publication called the uh, done by the Commonwealth in 2020. So what they look at is basically about six things. Uh, first is about health and well-being. And when I came to join, I, I listened to uh, the former uh, person talking talking about health and well-being, uh, also on education, uh, about employment and opportunity, uh, about political and civil participation uh, for youth, uh, equality and inclusion, uh, and peace and, and security. So because of time, because I have only 10 minutes to speak to this, I'm just likely to pick like three of these uh, domains and just be able to speak uh, to it. Uh, but then when we have the discussion, we can open it up to talk about uh, other issues. Yeah. Okay, so first to the evidence and uh, what I term to be opportunities. Uh, when we talk about uh, our young people, as I mentioned, I'm looking into three key issues on what evidence we have, uh, particularly about young people on, on their health and well being. About 1.3 million adolescents died, you know, in just 2020. Uh, if you look into the figure 2019, that was about 1.5 million adolescents, you know, that died. Uh, but that was outside the COVID uh, uh, estimation. So if you had then the COVID, uh, uh, those were lost to, to COVID to that, uh, then the figure is likely to be more than that. But you look into that and you think about the body, where, where is this concentrated? Most of this death happens in poor countries, uh, mostly in South South Africa. South South Africa alone accounted for about 37.9% of all death, you know, among young people. And you look into it, it is uh, the most causes of death among young people are issues due to injuries, injuries due to road accidents, all forms of accidents due to violence. Uh, we just had now in the US, uh, a young boy just killed about 10 people, uh, about self harm. And also now uh, looking to the gender construct of if uh, young women that we lose uh, to maternal health, uh, those who are involved in what we call either high-risk birth or due to abortion uh, and many other issues related to maternal health. On education, the statistics also show that about 61% of young people are unable to achieve what is called the minimum proficiency levels, you know, and also unable to complete uh, the lower secondary school. Uh, you look that more closely uh, across gender, then you see that women are more disproportionately uh, affected. So about eight of 10 adolescents are not learning. We are not learning live in just three regions of the world. Uh, you see them more in Sub-Saharan Africa, about 63 million, about 89 million in Central Asia and Southern Asia, and about 30 million in Eastern and Southeastern Asia together. So about one third of youth are not schooling. They are not working and not training. That's when you are quoting the World Bank evidence of 2020 and also what we saw in the Global Youth Development Index of 2020, uh, which also suggests issues about the employ employability, uh, also about the availability of even jobs, you know, to engage uh, uh, these young people. But on the other hand, also we think about then what are we missing? What opportunities are we missing if we do this? One of those key issues that came out from the Lancet of 2016 was that when you weigh the investment in health for younger people, the return on the investment is usually about triple, you know, uh, what you get when you invest in uh, other group. So when we talk about health and we look into their health, therefore, the opportunity therefore is for us to look into therefore, therefore, do we drive policy that improve the health of these young people? Also, when you look into a, education and issue about employment, what are the opportunities? 
what we have seen, uh, the World Bank 2014 reports, and many other reports also in the education, talks about the return, you know, on investment for education. Uh, particularly if a young person has a post-secondary education, then there's a 17% increase, you know, on the return of that investment. And this may even be higher when you look into these poor countries in sub-Saharan Africa, the return on investment may be as high as 21% you know, when we invest in education. Uh, particularly when you invest in guest child education, then you have a higher return on investment. So when we take this as background, therefore, what therefore should guide, you know, the policy as we discuss today? The, the map I showed on this, uh, is it the left to you now, the right? Uh, it's just about the WHO publication and uh, uh, on their site about countries uh, who has deliberate policy <clears throat> in addressing the health of young people. And you see that almost all countries in Africa, you see that there's no data, you know, to say that, I mean, they have uh, policy that really targeted towards improving the health of young people. For those that you have, you see where they are spread completely out, out of Africa, most, mostly in Europe. So therefore, there should be policy targeted towards ensuring provision of health services to youth. As the WHO rightly frame it, it's not just about having uh, provided services. Such services should be equitable, should be accessible, designed in such a way that speak to uh, the youth need that also they can also assess it. It must be acceptable to them. That is, they must also be part of you know, the development to see what, what works for them. It must be appropriate and also must be effect effective. And this also must include issues related to mental health because you look into statistics now, mental health is one of the major burden that we have among young people. And of course, issue about sexual and reproductive health of young people. In Sub-Saharan Africa, issue related to unwanted pregnancy and abortion is one of the leading causes of death among young girls. So those also should form the priority as we look into investment in health issue. Beyond that, also have evidence about how do we also involve young people uh, as equal partners, as leaders, you know, in moving forward the global health policy and practice, including making decisions about policy at a global level. Uh, so we need to see how we involve uh, young people in the design, in policy decision at global level and also at regional levels. Evidence by Cateria that, that, that was published just last year also showed that in all of the funding for research on F issues generally, only 2.2% of the total global fund or assistance on, 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 on research are devoted towards youth issues. Uh, I think, and I think many, many other research officers will, will look at it and say there is need therefore to look into how to improve funding, you know, uh, that targeted towards health uh, of, of young people. We need to know more about issues affecting young people, also developing policies and program, you know, that affects uh, young people. Not just that we want to do research about young people also, they also need to be engaged. It's also part of uh, skill building to see how they also form uh, part of researchers also researching, you know, uh, on issues about, about, about the health of young people. So we need to also see them as researchers coming together also, even in the process, you know, of collecting data, of analysis, etc. We don't also need, just to need to look at them as subjects. They need to be uh, in, in, involved in all of these processes. On education, uh, I, I had the last speaker talking about why we need to correct these imbalances in, in education. Uh, this is the statistics we have from UNESCO for year 2017, you know, just looking into youth literacy rate by region. Okay. And of course, you see the poor countries, how they fear uh, from that. So that leads to about what type of policy therefore do we need to develop, you know, in addressing this issue of education. First is that we need to invest globally on education. Education is seen as uh, the only thing to educate the mind and improve the skill uh, of young people. So nations, uh, regions, and globally, there seem to increase therefore the investment we have in young people. 
We need to also ensure gender equity in educational outcomes. Uh, the, the last report by WHO showed particularly in developing countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Southeast Asia, in South South Asia, a very wide gap between men, uh, between young boys and young girls in terms of uh, educational outcomes. We need to close those gaps. Uh, we need to develop strategies to see particularly how to improve girls' child education. Beyond that also is about the curriculum that have been taught in schools, high schools, post-high schools, tertiary institutions. We need to see how those curriculum become a bit more innovative, also that promotes entrepreneurship, and also make sure that uh, when uh, young people go to school, they have the necessary skills, you know, to therefore transit into, uh, into, into the job market. Okay. We also need to promote what is called the non-formal and informal education. Non-formal and informal education are for people, maybe they've completed primary schools, they need there something to learn about skills in order just to empower them to move straight to uh, the job market. We need to see how we prioritize that, particularly for those set of people, uh, and we need to promote that. Uh, many uh, countries across Sub-Saharan Africa I think in Nigeria, we just have only one university now that was established just about five years ago. That is called the University for Technical uh, School. Otherwise, we need to change this approach to having conventional universities to focusing on, on type of university or post uh, secondary school education that is focused on this, this type of people. We also need to think about alternative learning opportunities to vulnerable youth. And if there's one lesson we learned during COVID is to say that uh, conventional way of teaching uh, may not be able to address uh, educational needs of people. So we need to therefore think about alternative ways. We have people who are disabled. We have people, maybe by choice of where they live, ATC, that is a bit difficult for them, you know, to, to assess educational opportunities uh, in other sites. So we need to develop alternative learning opportunities to youth, particularly these vulnerable youths. I'm going to our hello 2020. It is better therefore also for universities curricula to be of high quality and also to help in making sure that graduates from universities have the prerequisite skills that are useful for industry. Unemployment and economic opportunities. Uh, the only essence of uh, the demographic dividends analysis is first to see into how do we therefore make sure that uh, we make the best, uh, the maximum impact of the budget youth that we have globally. So employment and economic opportunity therefore must be uh, a, a clear focus. Governments at all levels, uh, international, uh, regional and national must look into alternative ways, you know, of improving the economy uh, opportunities for young people. So policies therefore must target it towards creating employment opportunities for young people. Uh, not just about economic opportunity, opportunities also that look into uh, being able to align the skills of these young people to uh, the job market. At sectoral level, there is need for government at all levels also to develop policy, you know, that foster innovation and creation of jobs. We need to create new sectors and we need to be able to have also to raise productivity across. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution, the ICT revolution, uh, present both uh, opportunities and challenges. Challenges in the sense that a lot of uh, work uh, that needed uh, human beings before now, <laughs> machine are taking over. But it also provided the opportunity for people also who are skilled in ICT to also be able to harness such opportunities for their own. So we need therefore also to like open up, you know, the ICT opportunity for people in terms of improving the training for young people so that they continue to be relevant in the labor market. Policy need to see how young people also, uh, how we improve, they improve access to technology and internet, uh, particularly in most developing countries. One of the lessons also we learned during COVID, uh, we did a, some assessment is to say that many universities and many schools uh, across many of these developing countries were unable to function or respond uh, promptly uh, during the COVID. Why? Because 
they have limited uh, access to technology, they have limited access to internet. So at global level, therefore, there is need therefore for us to look into that. How do we improve access to technology? How do we also improve access to internet? How do we make technology uh, affordable you know, to poor people, particularly those who live uh, in rural communities? We also need to be able to create policies to generate sufficient number of decent jobs that be able to equip young people uh, with skills uh, that are required for, for these jobs. That's it for policy that provides incentives for young people to engage in technology uh, entrepreneurship. On political and civil participation, we need to see how to liberalize that uh, uh, part uh, of the sector, in which case that we need to look into it to see how to promote the participation of young people in politics and leadership positions. Uh, this is not just, uh, as has been said, to say you are giving them handouts, no. There's a need to develop young people in terms of their skills. There's a need to also develop them to be able, you know, to play a key leadership role, you know, across the nations. Particularly in most developing countries, you look into statistics of leaders in Africa, the average age will be like between 60 and 70. That's it for paradigm shifts. At both national level to sub-national level, we need to see how uh, we encourage young people to acquire the required uh, political skills and leadership skills uh, to be able to provide uh, leadership. So we need also to engage them in policy that will shape their future. Uh, we were discussing this somewhere and I said, well, it is, it is difficult for us to always sit down and make policies for young people when they are not involved in part of that decision when they are not involved in part of that thinking. So policies, therefore, that also uh, will shape the future of young people. It's therefore in, uh, appropriate to engage these young people in de designing and developing such policies. Uh, because of time, I want to stop at this, but as I said, uh, I'm open uh, for the discussion and also, uh, these are part of those things that I would happy to talk about, but 10 minutes, I just think it's, it's uh, so, so thank you again for listening. Thank you very much, Akani, for this very interesting and rich uh, contribution to our conference. Uh, you've addressed a, a variety of uh, policy priorities, uh, so, uh, which gives us a, a very good basic to, to, to talk about. And I would like to give our uh, two uh, commentators, uh, O'Neill and Matt, uh, the opportunity to, to comment on what you've just uh, presented to us. And so, Matt, would you like to, to start um, to, with your remarks? to the presentation. Sure, thank you. And thanks Akani for the, the, the great presentation. Uh, it's not maybe remarks, it's just maybe um, giving another perspective to that uh, in the line of what I said before, uh, because I'm a strong believer that the most vulnerable children and adolescents and young should be the priority. And I think we should put our effort in learning to read in order to have reading to learn in some ways. Because we can speak about employability, we can speak about entrepreneurship, we can speak about youth engagement. They are all very important topics. But I want to speak and being the voice of those that will never come in the Zoom video, that have the illiterate people as, a, as parents, that are just unvoiced, never heard. And we can speak about digital learning. I have a big program in my research unit where we, we, we look at uh, learning, um, digital learning with, uh, for example, Microsoft with uh, what we call the, the learning passport or other programs. But the, the problem is that just in Africa, half of the population, more than half of the population has not even electricity. So let alone connectivity, let alone internet, let alone all those things. And I want to speak for them because, okay, we can do all those conferences, we can do all those talks, we can do all those policy debates with university, with academics, and it's very good, it's very interesting, it's very, very, very stimulating intellectually. But I just want to, to, to say that at the end of the day, it's 25 years I work in uh, education, international development, 25 years I hear the same things. 
from UNESCO, from the World Bank, from even my own organization now, UNICEF, doing this shopping list of the things. I think we need to be a game changer. I think we need to focus on the real thing. I, mean, we, we, I think we need to need to focus on the poorest people, not those that are the richest in, 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 in their country, those that have no voice, those that have just no, no, no opportunity to learn. Uh, we can speak about secondary education, we can speak about higher education, they are very important. But at the end of the day, when we are talking about Sub-Saharan Africa, the thing is that we are so lagging behind on the basics, on the foundational skills that are leading to the rest. When you compare where we are on just primary education, completion rate, as we call it, or enrollment rate, now in Sub-Saharan Africa, 70%. Compared to where rich countries, like my own country, France, or others, were, at the time we were at the same level for a secondary education and higher education, there are those that have been missed out. The primary education, the pre-primary education, that's where we should put our efforts. So I don't want to be too long. I don't want to uh, monopolize the, 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 the floor. But if I have one key message is, or two, sorry, two key message. One is let's focus on the most important thing because the foundational skills are leading to the rest. But you cannot learn digital skills when you don't even know how to read, correct? And 90% of Sub-Saharan Africa, kids are not able to read the simple text by the age of 10. So we are not talking about a, a tiny part. We are talking about the majority, unfortunately, of the children in Africa. And I live in Africa for eight years. I have worked in 40 countries in Africa. So I know what I'm talking about, sorry. And the second thing is, how do we do as academic, Christian, you are a doctor, you work in a big university. The other, uh, uh, I can is the same. You will work in the big university. How do we do research? that is more useful, that is more used, that is more leading to, uh, to improvement of the most vulnerable children improvement of their life. And there is more and more research now on the use of research, including from very clever people, smart people from the London School of Economics, from Harvard, from MIT, whatever. They all say the same. When we do co-creating, co-creation, co-created research with governments, with youth, youth, of course, with children, we are making more difference because we design the research with them and we make the research being their own research and not the research of the World Bank, not the research of UNICEF, not the research of University of Nigeria, not the, that's their research. And when we do that, it leads to the, the change in policy, and not only policy, because policy is just a paper, but the implementation of policy, what is happening in the classroom, the, le the learning that is due to all children, happening more. Sorry, I'm a bit long, and I'm, I'm very uh, passionate about this topic for like 25 years, but I wanted to put that on the table. Back to you, Christine. Thank you very much, Matt, for, again, for this very strong and uh, very interesting uh, a comment that you've made. and. Uh, I would now li like to give O'Neill uh, the opportunity to, to answer to the presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, thank you, Professor Kinney, for this really uh, interesting presentation that tackles different aspects of uh, policy supporting younger people. And I definitely also agree with Mathieu's perspective, being also growing up from in Paris from a middle class family, but being originally from the Republic of Congo, I definitely resonate with his speech about thinking about those who are forgotten and those don't who don't have access even to the basic um, education. And I think that um, 
definitely governments have responsibilities and international organizations such as the World Bank Group, the UNICEF have responsibilities in that field and should take action. But I would also like to highlight that even as a community, we can organize ourselves to make changes even at the local level. And I could cite different organizations, but I have one in mind, for instance, that we have invited to speak at the, the Youth Summit coming next week, uh, which is Malaika and has been on for five, 15 years now and has been working a lot on education of women in the Rep Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, education of girls and women in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So I think that a lot of things can be done also at the community level to make changes in that level. Uh, but I would also like to touch upon accessibility of education for younger people, uh, because again, it's really important to talk about those who are kind of forgotten or we don't really think of. And I would like to highlight two groups of younger people that we might not think of all the time when we talk about access to education. So it's persons with disabilities and then you grow up in an environment of conflict, fragility or violence. Um, so with regard to um, uh, children or youth with uh, disabilities, they are often the most marginalized and excluded from educational opportunities because beyond the issue of having access to school, they are also often facing barrier when they are at school because the services provided are not adapted to their needs. Um, and again, I'm going to be... Um, quoting uh, and talking about the work being done by the World Bank Group here, but they have been committing, they have, the World Bank Group has committed to having all its education programs and projects disability inclusive by 2025. So I don't know if it's, I, I think that in light of what Mathieu has said, it's already a step forward, but obviously more can be done. But I would like to highlight, for instance, one project that has been done to, to help um, education be more disability inclusive, and it's the Disability Inclusive Education in Africa, in Africa Africa Program Trust Fund, which is a $3 million trust fund funded by USAID and the Inclusive Education Initiative, launched with the support of the British and Norwegian governments, and that is part of the different initiatives, basically, that are providing coordinated technical expertise and resources to country to support them in making the education system disability inclusive, to make sure that no one is left behind. Now, talking about uh, youth in environment of um, violence, context, conflict, and, and uh, fragile context. Um, we know that um, for the past years and our world has been shaken by a lot of conflict, even some are still ongoing, in addition to the pandemic. And systems have struggled to deliver education services in those other adverse context. So what well, I'm thinking of armed conflict, natural disasters, political crisis, health epidemics, and pervasive violence. And so I think this is the reason why when uh, introducing global education program or initiative, it's also necessary to take those, uh, those things into consideration, think about social, political and economic context of the youth. And again, the World Bank Group has been doing some effort to address those, uh, those issues and has been committing, for instance, to building inclusive and adaptable systems in the countries at risk of falling into fragility or conflict. They have been also working on um, providing basic educational services and additional support during humanitarian crisis, while also trying to strengthen the resilience of education systems during the post-conflict and post-crisis recovery period. And finally, the World Bank is also trying to improve education services to address the educational and skill development needs of displaced population and host of communities. So just to say that um, when talking about education, it's really uh, important to have an access on making it accessible for all and obviously those who don't even have uh, the basic access to the, the, the basic education but also persons with disabilities or uh, youth evolving in situation of conflict violence or a fragile environment. Thank you very much O'Neill to, to bring this up and, and to remind us that we have especially vulnerable groups within this group of, of younger people that need to be focused on. Uh, before I would like to pass on the word to Akani to respond to, to what you've just said, uh, I would like to invite all of you to, to uh, jump into the discussion. If you want to, to answer questions, you can use the um, question and answer function that you will find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And you can just type in your question and uh, we will bring this into the discussion. Now, Akani, uh, would you like to respond? Oh, yes, Th thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, uh, thank you to 
uh, O'Neill and uh, Osoto Math, uh, and I think they hit it well on the nerve. Uh, but as Matt actually suggested, uh, priority should be on this uh, most vulnerable group, right? A lot of young people who cannot read and write, you know, uh, we need to prioritize them. We need to prioritize the guest child uh, education. So uh, I agree with that. And I think uh, there's need therefore also for, for support, you know, more to this, to this, uh, to this group of people. Also, as Onye rightly said, uh, beyond that also, we need to look into things also that are scalable, right? Uh, community engagement, community participation. Uh, how, do we, how, how do we also strengthen the community, you know, towards uh, supporting, you know, uh, young people? And I think there are several other examples, even in terms of research, in terms of another one. Uh, the one that I, re I remember very quickly is about the, 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 the project done on uh, menstrual hygiene. Because the project was not just only about collecting data. Through the process of doing research, the young people also were empowered, you know, to understand some of those basic things they need to do you know, about their menstrual hygiene. So I, I, I agree with uh, almost all of those submissions. Uh, we need to prioritize. We need to look at those who are the most vulnerable and also to see uh, how we get the uh, community to be more involved, you know, in, in many of those things that, that we do. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much for, for your answer. Now, if we agree that, that the early education might be the key or might be at least the thing that we have to focus on, that we have to start with, as Matt uh, put it in his statement. Um, yeah, I, I'm thinking, aren't we too positive about uh, what preschools and public systems can do in this early age? Or do we have to focus more on families uh, to support parents? Um, so, so let's not focus on the formal sector, but more on the informal or non-formal sector. Or how would you describe that? Where would you start and, and say that that should be the place where we should put the most effort into? So who, who would like to, to jump in and uh, take that question? Well, just to provide some uh, some details, particularly as we, we try to focus more again on Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, that in a lot of these uh, countries, uh, public institutions, including public schools, uh, the outcomes are not very good. Uh, the processes, uh, things, are, things are degenerating. Okay. So therefore, also, as you rightly said, uh, we, look, we need to look into those schools. How can things also be resuscitated? Uh, it's hard to think that things are better off uh, some 20 years ago than what we found in many public schools uh, across South Africa now. Uh, so there's a need therefore to focus on that. Uh, so Neil also rightly said, we need to also see how do we engage community. Okay, uh, I remember one of those years had the project, uh, Compass Project. Compass project look into this in a very holistic approach. How do you engage community? How do you engage family? How do you also engage uh, the educational institutions at local, at state level, at national level? So looking into things in that holistic way, I think for me will be the right way to go. So that ownership, accountability, and also transparency, you know, can be ensured uh, through, through that process. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank go. you. Now, I just want to say two things, if I can. One is to react to what O'Neill said, because I cannot agree more on the inclusive education for children with disabilities. Those kids, they are just invisible most of the time. They are invisible in the data, they are invisible in the research, they are invisible in the analysis, they are invisible in the sector planning, as we call it in many countries, education sector planning and policies. And so at the end of the day, they are invisible and not even taken into account in the classroom except when they are from a rich family. When you have a, a rich family in Africa or everywhere with a, ch a child with disability, of course, you find a way to, to take care of them. But most of them are not from a rich family and they are just invisible. So I just want to emphasize what Tony said about that. And there was some work done with uh, the World Bank, UNESCO, UNICEF, Global Partnership for Education. And I forgot in, my, in, the, in the chat, we have also FCDO, the new name of the UK uh, Ed, International Ed, David. Uh, and I put the link on the chat so people can look at it because I really strongly believe that when we start to analyze those 
those issues about being inclusive or not as an education system, we will make those kids more visible and we will be able at the end of the day to give them something. On the second point that you raised on Christian with uh, good intelligence, um, when do we start, blah, 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 blah. At the end of the day, uh, in spite of the, all the bad negative things I said, negative in a way that it's striking, it's heartbreaking, like when we are talking about people going to school and not learning, correct? It's like heartbreaking. There is still some, what I call some diamonds. There is still in low-income countries, in Africa, some schools where kids learn. And I, there is a big program actually that we are running in UNICEF Office of Research with great fundings from uh, Global Partnership for Education, Norway, um, ULED Foundation and others, where we try to identify the schools. What, are, what is happening in those schools? Those schools that in spite of being in difficult context in Africa, where the kids are learning more. What is happening in the dynamics in the classroom? What is happening in the dynamics between the teachers in the school? What is happening between the school and the school leader? What is happening between the school and the communities ahead of the village? What is happening there that is not happening in the school that are performing less? Because we want to learn from that and we want to find with governments, with district officers, the way to incentivize those practices that, and behaviors that we find in those schools that are not happening in the other schools in order to scale up those things and make a contribution to the learning outcomes. So there is more kids learning. Okay. Thank you very much, Matt. Well, we're looking at the time, our time is almost up. So <laughs> I'm, we cannot take any new questions, but I would like to give you the opportunity to say some final comment, final word, what you will take home from this uh, discussion or what you, would you like, one final thought that you would like to add uh, to, our, to our talk. Um, maybe uh, we can start with Akani and then uh, O'Neill and Matt, I think you've all <laughs> almost uh, presented your final statement, but uh, I will give you the last, the last word. So uh, Akani, please, uh, one, one uh, final remark. Thank you, Christian. Uh, the youth, uh, they are the future. Uh, uh, globally, uh, you look at it at regional uh, or sub-national levels. So they need their for to prioritize them. And whatever intervention we do in education, in F, uh, in employment, I think is critical uh, for development and also for sustaining self development. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, me to add to that, and my, I might sound a bit repetitive, but uh, yeah, for me, policy supporting younger people is all about inclusion, making sure that everyone is included, regardless of the social economic background, making sure that people that we feel like are not being seen. So might emphasize again uh, also about uh, children with disability, but all the communities that are not seen communities in the rural area, make sure that they're being seen and included in the efforts uh, in, in the field of education, but even in all the fields relating to supporting uh, policies of uh, policies for youth. And I think the other thing that I would like to say is about uh, the power that we have as a community. Obviously, government, international organization play a key role in making changes, but I think that ourselves individually, but also as a community, we have the power to make an impact and we should not forget that. Thank you very much. And finally, Matt. Well, I think I talk a lot already. I just want to, to thank you and I hope uh, the conversation was stimulating, useful. At the end of the day, everything can be a priority, but really if we focus on the inclusiveness, as O'Neill said, on the foundational learning, we can start to make a difference for those that were not lucky like me to be born in a good place. Okay. 
Thank you very much. And thanks to all of you who've contributed to this uh, discussion. I am, um, we, we did not have time to address all the topics within the policy. So we focused on education, but I'm very glad that we made a very strong statement, I think, for early inclusive education. That was very clear and very strong. So we, I will take this home from, from our discussion. Thank you very much for your valuable contributions. Thanks, Akani Akinyemi for the, for the keynote, O'Neill Masamba, and uh, Matt Brossa for your comments. And um, yeah, with this panel, also the Demo Berlin Demographic Days are coming now to an end now. And um, we would like to, to thank all our experts and, and speakers who have supported us during the last days. Thank you very much for your contributions and the great, to the great success of this event. And we hope that you've all benefited from this uh, conference and from the discussions as we have. And we are pleased uh, about the active participation of younger people that we had during the whole conference. That was uh, very encouraging. And I think it was a good uh, sign not to talk about or yeah, about the issues, but to talk with young people. Um, and we're, yeah, we will uh, be happy to inform you about the follow-up activities on this event and hope to welcome you uh, to next year's uh, conference. The date has not been uh, set, but we will let you know as soon uh, as we know. We'd also like the, to, to thank uh, the organizers of this conference, the wonderful team of Population Europe and Diakonie Deutschland for uh, organizing and hosting the conference. Thank you so much uh, to, to the whole wonderful team for your support. Uh, we'd also like to thank our partners during the last three days, uh, the German Youth Institute, the European Association, for Population Studies, the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and the United Nations Population Fund. Um, we'd also like to thank those who have supported us, um, the Federal Ministry for Family Affairs, Senior Citizens, Women and Youth, the Federal Ministry, Ministry of Health, the Federal Ministry of the Interior and Community, and also the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thanks to all of you for your support. And now it's, yeah, not my pleasure, but it's my duty to say goodbye to all of you and to end this conference. Thank you so much and hope to see you next year. Goodbye. <laughs>